Welcome to Taking the Myth, your topical, sceptical discussion show. I'm Stephen Knight and joining me is Iram Ramzanthrax. Hello. Buongiorno. <laughs> dangerous when ingested, apparently. I'm dangerous all the time, <laughs> Mr Knight. <laughs> How's it been going? It's good. Um, I was going to say it's been a while, but... We have seen each other too much, crop. too much. One might say, yeah, we did, yeah, the ones, you know, <laughs> um, what once in what two years, I think, is plenty, you know, any more, and you'll just end up becoming a stalker. Yeah, I think it's time to back off, yeah, cooling, come on. cooling off period, you know, easy. Well, we were at the secular conference together, you did a fantastic job hosting, by the way. Thank you. Um, I had a great time, there's some really interesting, passionate speakers there. You kind of think you're, when you spend a lot of your time preoccupied with this kind of subject matter, you kind of think you're well in the zone with it and you know where where all the information is and you've got your finger on the pulse and then you go to a, a place like that and you just hear from people who blow you away, who tell you stories and, and teach you things you had no idea were going on. Uh, what was your general takeaway from the event? Well, I got to meet people um, I haven't heard of before. There are some new activists on the scene now, which is great. Uh, it's got people who are from uh, Middle Eastern countries, especially um, Arab countries, who are openly atheist or agnostic now. And you, know, you really, it just hits home how we just take it for granted how many freedoms we have in this country, really. Whereas people in other countries just, uh, you know, they can be thrown into prison for just simply expressing their views. Um, and in general, I did like um, the topics and the discussions. Um, the, the second day, I thought, was um, a little bit more fiery. People were, you know, disagreeing more with yes, each other. that was nice to see. We had uh, we was. had a panel and there were a lot of uh, fiery disagreement on that. I was, I was really enjoying that. Yeah, I, I prefer fights, more of that. <laughs> <laughs> like actual headlocks, elbows yeah, to the need, face, that kind of thing. people pelting each other with, you know, pens and scraps of paper. Just, just you know, it livens things livens up a little bit. Up. More sure. of that, yeah. Okay. More violence. Well, hopefully, uh, it'll be just as good next year. I intend to keep beating the drum about that conference and, and trying to get to as many as I can as long as it continues because I think it's it's quite unique, really. Um, Mariona Marzi's done a, an amazing job to get all them people under one roof really it's quite an accomplishment yes um and it's not easy especially considering how some of them couldn't get visas and one of them was actually uh stopped on uh, at the airport in egypt they just wouldn't Jesus. let him go it's insane yeah talking of traveling uh, i've not had much chance to talk about your amazing adventures in pakistan please uh refresh our listeners memories as to what you've been up to well Jihadi bride. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. I knew you I couldn't, were going to I couldn't hold it in. God, such a stereotype. Um, contrary to um, popular opinion, I did not go off to get married or to become some sort of jihadist at all. Tell it to the Home um, Office. I went, I went on a charity trek um, across the northern parts of Pakistan. So that was in the Hunza Valley in Gilgit, Baltistan. Um, Bless you. So that was a four-day track in uh, to Rakaposhi base camp and the rest of the time I spent sightseeing uh, and it was absolutely fantabulous it was one of the best experiences of my life um, I mean I did get sick <laughs> while I was there so that bit wasn't fun no that wasn't enjoyable no it's 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 not it's not fun when you're puking up a mountain. Um, <laughs> uh, and you especially puke down when, the mountain here. I'm down the mountain. Well, I was puking both up and down the mountain. <laughs> just spraying the mountain. <laughs> just, just spraying the puke everywhere. <laughs> oh, what an image. So if yeah. we have any creative artists uh, listening to the podcast, if you can just mock up a quick MS Paint representation of our <laughs> fine co-host, Iran Ramzan, just, just puking up the side, up, up and down a mountain. Giving that oh mountain a, a, a puke wash, that'd be, that'd be lovely. Um, Please so... don't. <laughs> I'm going to put like a gun in, my, in one hand. Like, <laughs> don't know, like, you're vomiting on the other side. It's, it's not fun. No, do, do not listen to him. I mean, this was all for a good cause, though. You were puking for a good cause. 
at least a charitable cause. My 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 sweat, tears, and vomit went into it. Yes, yeah. um, no blood. It's not quite how they do it on children in need, but yeah, no you know, um, for effort. <laughs> Basically, the charity uh, I was raising money for is called Build Trust UK, and um, they've set up a lot of schools in more and more areas of of Pakistan, and and most of the students tend to be girls as well, and in a country like Pakistan, uh, you know female literacy um, nationally is not very high. I mean, in some areas it is it is high, like in the northern areas where I went, it's about 90 plus percent. But in uh, in the rest of the provinces, it's, um, it's shockingly low. Um, and, you know, a lot of parents decide that because if they're poor, they, they won't educate their child. It's more important to save up money for their daughter to get married. So, you know, if they if they can't afford the education, they'll just get married off, and they won't they won't finish their education either, and they'll get married at a very very young age. Uh, so that's why you you see um, high levels of um, you know child marriage in Pakistan as well, and that's why I chose that particular charity because it's um you know i've benefited so much from education in this country so i thought i'd love other girls to get that opportunity um yeah nicely done um, yeah and in in general that the i mean it's a lot of people don't know much about the northern areas especially uh hunza valley it's it's a lot different from the rest of pakistan it doesn't even feel like you're in pakistan actually um it's it's not as hot there, for example. Um, it's the the whole area is a bit of a respite from the intense heat of the rest of the country, um, and the people because they're used to seeing tourists in general. Um, they they're very relaxed and they're open minded, so they don't stare as at you as much. And as a woman, I felt very safe there as well, going out on my own, um, which um, can't be said for the rest of the country um and and i think that has to do with the fact that there are ismaili muslims they're not um really strict uh practicing um i mean they, they still believe it obviously but they're they're not um you don't get fundamentalism up there um in fact one of the women went into a shop on the high street and came out with a can of shandy oh nice <laughs> i know i never thought i would see that in Pakistan, but there you have it, Shandy from Hunza Valley. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, I'd love to go again. Okay, so as usual, American politics is in the news, or should we say the the, the goings on in the United States? And I, for some reason, I don't think that our goings on in Great Britain travel across the pond. I think it's a one way street. I don't think. Americans are waking up and like turning on CNN and getting a full breakdown of the Brexit negotiations and then hearing about the Big Ben renovations and where we are in our terms of politics. Do you think that happens? I think they might be interested. I think they might be more interested in Big Ben rather than Brexit. <laughs> Benjamin really Grande. Think, you know, as big, I like. big Ben is not bonging anymore. Yeah, yeah. controversial. Well, Charlottesville is the big thing. That's what everyone's talking about. It's been consuming all the news channels in the UK. It's obviously dominating discourse in the States. I want to break it down, really, I suppose, into three parts that we need to cover. I think we need to talk about why people gathered in Charlottesville, what happened when they did, and third and finally, what the response to it was with a specific focus on Donald Trump. It's difficult to say Donald Trump without adding some sort of pejorative, if you notice. And I try and I try and avoid that kind of thing because I think it's cheap. But even I want to say like Doran, Donald, fuckface, Trump. Do you know what I mean? And I, I think that's really cheap. It, it, it annoys me when I hear other people do it. But when I say that man's name, I feel like adding something vicious for some reason. I think I need to see somebody. Um, I, th- I think it is only natural because every time I hear, <laughs> I hear his name... I just think, oh, God, what buffoon. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. and then you have to remind yourself, crap, he's president. And he's, he's not even been president for a year. Um, so we have 
quite a way to go. We have problems. Another election. Sam Harris made a great point on his podcast the other day, which I hadn't really considered, and that's that everybody is talking about politics at the moment, everybody, and that's actually a bad indication of how politics is going because people mm. aren't, people might say, well, it's good for people to have a renewed interest in politics and they're not mm. interested in politics in the in the sense that I'm going to become a politician or I'm going to influence change or change legislation or run for this or that and campaign or whatever. They're interested in politics because they're outraged and want to vent. Yeah. Everyone's angry with politics at the minute, and that's that's a sure sign that politics isn't going well. So, Charlottesville, uh, th- this is, uh, I suppose, an interesting topic. It's kind of a, a side issue, but it's worth getting your thoughts on. And that's how, well, I, I'm going to call it whitewashing is how I see it, I suppose. And that's removing monuments and, and placards and things from an era uh, at a time that represent people that were in step with the, you know, the, the ethics of the day. Uh, but I fell afoul of 21st century standards and we retroactively try and wipe their legacy away in terms of removing statues, placards, street names, etc. Okay, um, I can... I think everyone has the right to an opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, I think every. I know that should go without saying, but you really do have to sometimes say it, unfortunately. But there are some people who don't want to see uh is it robert e lee's statue that they wanted to bring down yeah. the confederate leader okay no slavery. so yes for understandable reasons people don't want to see um you know this man being honored yeah I for, get that. For, for for you know for the legacy and for what he actually did that's fair enough and there are some on the other side who see him as some sort of hero and they're entitled to their opinions. And, you know, I I don't think there's a necessarily a right or a wrong when it comes to removing statues. I think it just depends on how people feel. But, you know, pulling a statue down doesn't erase history. You know, you can pull a statue down, you can pull a painting down or knock a building down, but it doesn't actually change anything really, does it? Um so the aim of these protesters apparently was to was to you know show that they were against this statue going and then um didn't stay very peaceful now did it it did not um i mean my, my view on this if people want to go through official channels and petition and and you know campaign to get statues what have you removed fine it's it's completely their right uh, and i can understand it i saw a girl on the news I forget her name, um, talking uh, earlier on. she was I think she was outside the funeral of the girl who died, Heather Heyer, which we'll get to, but she was saying that she sees statues of these individuals and it's kind of a spit in the face to her ancestors. It's kind of mocking her. And I, I can completely understand that and I agree with that, but what we are talking about is feelings, really. Um, so, I mean, yes. it, it becomes about whose feelings weigh more in this situation. And, and, and another thing... I think if like you've made a great point, you are not removing the history by removing the monument. However, you are removing a talking point. So I remember a while back uh, in London, they were talking about removing the street uh, street sign names of, of of named after families who were who were slavers of the day. Uh, it's, it's sort of I don't know why they thought this would somehow help the issue of slavery, or that why people when they go down these streets celebrate the fact that you know I'm, oh, I'm gonna go I'm gonna take Slavers Avenue today because that's the avenue for me. It's not how people think. So. My point on this is, if you leave it there, it's a talking point to tell people, well, that's named after this and this is what happened. And this actually is a thing that happened and we can never, you know, do it again. It can't be repeated. We need to learn from our history. This is such a guy, you know, he believed in this and that. Uh, These were terrible views and this can't be, you know, this isn't applicable today. And you can have a discussion. But in a way, if you remove these things, you sort of uh, removing an opportunity for this discussion, assuming you have a sensible person chairing the discussion but the, i mean i don't know if you've seen it's happening in england a bit now as well they're trying to retroactively remove uh winston churchill uh statues and busts because of you know his imperialist attitude and some of the things he said about islam and things like that and I, for fuck's sake <laughs> yeah and fine if that's how you want to spend your days that's all right that is your right however if these are the big race issues of your day like i'm going to fight racism and my number one priority is getting the winston churchill bust removed 
you're not fighting racism for one. And it kind of reflects the fact that racism probably has improved a lot since Winston Churchill's day that you have to go after busts. Uh, and that's not to say there isn't any racism. Disclaimer, there, there is racist. There are too many racists. One racist is too many. So, I mean, Peter Bogosian made a great point a while back. I think it was a tweet I saw. He, uh, it, you have to buy this simple point, but I think it stands. The, the, the point is this, that in progressive nations, more and more people are, are thinking that uh, we will eventually all converge to a, a vegan diet. We'll, we'll all realise the horrors of factory farming and, and processing living creatures for nourishment and we'll abandon it and we'll move to synthetic meats or, you know, uh, a vegan-based diet or whatever. So when that happens, eventually, and society looks back on the way our society treats animals and derives our uh, sustenance from meat products will they judge us as almost like slavers etc and if so will they be down for removing monuments of anyone who had a fucking mcdonald's at some point in their life Uh, where does this stop with progression because we're going to end up with no history eventually if we remove everything from an era that doesn't gel with today's standards exactly i just and don't you fucking dare turn off big ben for four years (laughs) had to get that in there (laughs) i think i think stopping big ben ringing is a symbolism of how they're trying to silence us and silence (laughs) our freedom and how are we going to know the time in london iram (laughs) how and everyone's going to be late for work it's going to be chaos i know omg we all have pocket watches and monocles in london Hello, hello, love. Hello. Do they all do they all ride penny farthings as hey, well? Hey, what time is it? Oh, I don't know. The Big Ben's off, isn't it? All right, mate. All right. So yeah. So I don't. I don't really care you're about. Back to Charlottesville. You're back to Charlottesville. Let's not make light of neo-Nazi terrorism. Um, yeah, I don't really care about monuments and plaques. Remove them if you want, but I think you you're missing an opportunity there. So, like you said, it wasn't very peaceful. So people that are actually carrying Nazi flags, which yes. is just... It's insane, isn't it? Wow. I mean, and, uh, I don't, it's, I, it's just unbelievable, really. It is. Now, the thing is, and this is going to get me into trouble as well, um, there have always been Nazi groups in, in America. That small More groups... About. Small groups, but they exist. I've never doubted this. I've never denied this. But my opinion on this is that they have been politically and culturally defeated. Nobody votes for Nazi parties in America. And people go, Donald Trump, the White House is following. He's not a Nazi. Grow up, people. Donald Trump is not. If that's your play on Donald Trump, Ah, ah, you are wrong. But, you know... The uh, the KKK guy on Twitter thanked him. Therefore, he is a Nazi. Yes, well, that's that's something we we I want to talk about specifically. But um, so like I said, they've been defeated politically and culturally. If you are a Nazi and announce yourself as a Nazi in You're most twat. yes, and and you do this most places in America, you are gonna have a bad time. There's gonna be a lot of hostility coming your way, and that is a good thing because society doesn't like Nazis. Nazis is the go-to evil stereotype you can grab on anything. Nobody likes a Nazi. No one's getting a Nazi discount at Walmart. So no one's voting for him. Cult- culture hates them. Now I do think so, so I think we're getting ahead of ourselves. Donald Trump's response to this has been woeful, I said, and very weak. And people yeah, are saying it's, it's Donald Trump. Yeah, people are saying, but he's... he is Donald Trump. I mean, I know, I know he's the president, and you know we have standards, but it's Donald Trump. Did we really expect anything else? I, I think Nazi parties and far right fascist white supremacist groups have been emboldened by the election of Donald Trump in the White House. I do. I will happily, not happily, but I will freely accept that these numbers have increased or people who have always felt that way uh, feel more comfortable doing it in the open coming out in Charlottesville now and that's a real concern and everybody should be concerned about it. Do you think as someone suggested do you think America is becoming so dangerous now that anyone who's a, a visible minority should be scared? No definitely not and there's something to talk about yeah, in that respect that like we and you we have we, we talk on this podcast we don't write things down we don't prepare so we kind of... Uh, oh, give it our secrets away Yeah, now. kind of think as if people hadn't yourself, noticed, as if I'm people hadn't noticed. So we're kind of thinking out loud. So you'll have to excuse my inarticulation on this point. So at this rally, a man drove his car, from what I could tell, intentionally into a group of protesters. Now that to me is terrorism. If you intentionally drive your car into a group of people who are just 
um, you know, fulfilling their rights as American citizens to congregate and protest. Uh, that's a political act to me. That's terrorism. Yeah. And I, I, I imagine he'll be treated as such, or at least I hope he will. And we're still waiting to get all the details, but it seems fairly straightforward to me. Now, when that happened and that poor girl died, uh, Heather Heyer, early 30s, she didn't deserve that. It, there is no it's, no 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 buts, no ifs here. He, there's only one person responsible for that act, and that's the guy behind the wheel. I'm not having the, well, they behave badly too, etc. No, he's responsible. However, and here's the point where I'm treading difficult waters here, and that's people who are hysterical about Nazis here, Nazis everywhere, everyone's a Nazi, you're a Nazi, it's a Nazi takeover. Before this happened, I've now gone, ha, see, we warned you about this and you ignored us. Now, this is an act of terrorism, without a doubt, but it's not necessarily uh, a stereotypical neo-Nazi act of terrorism. And when I say that, what I mean is, this guy hasn't woke up in the morning with his little neo-Nazi brain and gone, right, now's the day that I go and grenade the synagogue. Now's the day I go and mow down some black people or blow up a black church, etc. Which is the kind of thing people have been warning us about in terms of Nazis. Nazis hate minorities, etc. This hate is rising. This is a guy who's killed a white woman at a rally that was violent, where the conditions had been made where something bad was likely to happen because of the conditions of that event. That's my view on this, and that's probably what's going to get me in trouble. Thank you, Nazi. Yep. Nazi night. So it seems almost a self-fulfilling prophecy that it would happen, be the way that the tensions have been ratcheting it up on both sides. And Donald Trump's got in a lot of trouble for saying there was violence on both sides. Now, to be fair, a lot of what he said at that press conference is right. I just don't understand why he felt the need to see it, say it when one of his own citizens has been murdered by a fascist at a rally full of neo-Nazis and white supremacists. Well, I think um, I think someone pointed out um, earlier that when Obama refused to name the problem of Islamist extremism, and you know Donald Trump was there saying, "Oh, the president needs to spell it out. He needs to say what the problem is." Um, I think if somebody can um, find where he's actually said this, the tweets or something. So he's he's called Obama out in the past. So I can understand why people think he should actually name the the problem um, as opposed to just saying oh, violence everywhere must be condemned. That sounds very vague. That sounds like something Corbyn would well, he, say. Actually. He did actually, just to be uh, clear on this point, in his subsequent address to the press, he did name neo-Nazism and, and white supremacy. I think he called it repugnant. Um, so he has named it. The problem is he's, he reminds me of an Islamist that when charged with the task of denouncing terror says, yes, terrorism is bad, but so is drones. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So mm. It, the American people, really, there's a big contingent of the mainstream media who are just outraged at the suggestion that maybe some of the anti-fascists were violent, which is ridiculous because they clearly are. It's well documented. It, I mean, put all our ducks in a row here. There was a lot of people on the right at that rally who went there to protest, wasn't looking for trouble. There were a lot of people on the left felt the same way. There were other groups within them groups that were just looking for trouble and were violent. And they, that was just a, like a, a boiling pot of what, yeah. you know. You always get that. But but have you noticed all these anti-fascists, they never really turn up to Islamist demonstrations or anything. And as far as I'm aware, I've never seen them at you know, say when Andrew Chowdhury used to have his friggin' demonstrations, I don't think any of the anti-fascist crowds used to used to be at his protest to to counter demonstrate. If I'm wrong, then fair enough. But they always it's it's just it's just so easy for people to to denounce Nazis. Yeah, um, I think maybe it's, it's just just such an easy thing. Nazis to do. are bad, Iram. I am good. Nazis bad. Can I have it's a cookie? Like, I mean, it's like, it's like saying, oh, we must condemn murder. Like, for fuck's sake, is a bar that low? I mean, it's so easy just to to criticise Donald Trump or swear at him or um, protest against Nazis. These are easy things to do because everyone hates them and people will applaud them for doing so. But, you know, they won't go for something that's slightly more difficult for them to do. That's absolutely spot on but I think it might be a little bit different with the American dynamic because I think they have fewer 
Islamist in that regard. Okay, no, no, I know. Um, and, and I wasn't sort of making that comparison mm. there. I know in America it's different. They they definitely have more of a problem with um, with with the, with with the, those on the right, I guess, or the far right or Nazis. Um, but I mean, here in the UK, it's just. You know, everyone's always going on about how evil Nazis are, or the alt right are, but, and and again, those are easy things to to criticise. I called Donald Trump's response to this woeful, uh, woefully inadequate and weak. Yeah, but what do you expect? He's woefully inadequate himself. Yeah. Why did anyone expect a better response from him? I, I just thought... And even, if he, even if he had given the, the, the perfect response, it's people still would have said, oh, but you, your election led to this. You being president, you know, has led to the rise of this, this and that. So even if he had come out with something spectacular, it's Donald Trump, no one cares. No one's going to be happy with whatever he says. Yeah. It's like it's Donald Trump, but he, I think it was shit. Um, it it and, was, of course it's shit. It's Donald Trump. Yeah, it's Donald Trump. So, but people were confused by this. And, and I mean, I, I thought he took the opportunity to make it about his personal vendetta about the media. When everything else is happening, this narcissist turned it inwards about himself and how it's oh, fake it's always, news. It's always how me, he's, me, Yeah, how his speech well. was fine. But I want people to consider this when they, they disagree with me about this Trump speech. They tell me that, well, he's named the problem, which he has, and he's condemned it, which he has. Now, I, I agree. I've heard that, I've seen it, and I'm still saying it's inadequate and weak. And case in point, Nazis have seen that speech, white supremacists have seen that speech and thought he was defending them. So how piss poor does your message have to be on white supremacy (laughs) and Nazism when Nazis and white supremacists say, that's my boy? when you go on TV allegedly denouncing these things. So it's obviously he's not doing enough. He's obviously not communicating what the society needs to hear on these topics. Um, he's, he's too busy, um, you know, having a Barney with North Korea, really, and, and, and ramping up that rhetoric. It's, it's just clear where his priorities are. You can call Obama piss weak on Islamists, and I did, and I have. Uh, I thought his rhetoric was pointless half the time, but there were no Islamists around the country going, thanks a lot, Obama, he's our guy, he's defending us. They were not, you know, it, there was no doubt as to where we fell on this argument. It just wasn't mm. good enough. Now, if you're thinking Trump's good enough on this point, yet white supremacists and Nazis are actually celebrating his words in speeches where he's apparently denouncing them, he's obviously missing the mark by quite a bit. So that's how I feel about that. This poor woman's dead. Yeah. And America just seems on a constant knife edge. People are ratcheting it ratcheting it up even worse. We had Owen Jones tweeting out memes of uh, Richard Spencer getting punched. You know, fuck Richard Spencer. Fuck that white supremacist Nazi. I don't care about him. What I care about is the escalation of violence because it's all fun and games when Nazis are getting punched in the face. But then when a, a Heather Heyer gets mowed down and we say, whoa, whoa, whoa violence isn't the answer violence is unacceptable by what means do you invoke that moral superiority when you've been telling these people openly and engaging in violence and creating this climate where they're expecting violence at any point it's it's acceptable to use violence if someone's a nazi or if we don't like their views um but violence is unacceptable when it's someone we think is worthy of of our solidarity and our empathy and i mean really owen jones come on he should know better he's always going on about how much um how much he's getting trolled and abused online um and then he just come comes out with that i mean really it it doesn't help and it's only going to get worse and these people are i mean obviously the people right so here's how i feel about this the people on the right the far right shall we say have got much 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 worse ideas than the people on the far left without a doubt the people on the far right are are bigots they're racist they're homophobes they hate women they stand for everything i absolutely despise the people on the far left to me are actually thinking they're defending pro- progressive values but it's so wrong-headed they don't realize that actually that you're just emboldening the elements that they hate um that's what uh, that's the point that um she called iona on twitter made she was saying there's no equivalence between the far left and the far right because even though the far left are wrong in some of their tactics it's not coming from a bad place it's coming from what they perceive is a good thing yeah 
whereas with the far right, it's not. It's not coming from a good place at all. So it's not really equivalent. And I know people are going to disagree with us on that one, well, I think. They might even disagree with this next point, which is, as I've just said, the 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 ideas on the far right are, are, are guaranteed to be more hateful and horrible than the far left. I accept that. But the chances of violence coming from one side or the other, to me, in recent years, has felt about equal. And to be honest, it's just slipping over to the point now where actually uh, I can see it coming more from far left circles. Granted, I am saying this on the back of a situation where a woman's just been killed by someone on the right, but that wasn't the first instance of violence. We have seen so many on campuses, at rallies, uh, anywhere you can think of, we've seen far left violence and obviously far right violence. So Yeah, I, I agree. I see what you mean about the the violent part, but I think I think especially with the timing of it all, a lot of people would just say oh, but look what's just happened, the far right did this, how can you say otherwise, blah, 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 Nazi sympathiser. I, I, can, I can appreciate that, but this is, I'm, I'm amazed nobody's been killed up until now, and, it, and my point is it could have been somebody on the right, it could have been somebody on the left. Uh, this has been gearing up, people have been clobbered, people have, cars have actually drove into people in other protests before this, this isn't the first time this has happened, and I'm amazed nobody's been killed, people have been shot so I, I am amazed this is the first fatality we've had. So I think people just need to stop being violent is the main main point of my message, Bill. I think everybody's incredibly angry about it and it's very raw and it's difficult to do the proper accounting at the moment. Um, but one final thing I will say is if you're president of a nation where people are openly, proudly displaying swash stickers and, and shouting things about gays and shouting, chant, chanting things about faggots, etc. And this is... And Jews. And Jews. Yeah, it's always the Jews. I think yeah. you need to be a bit more less piss weak than Donald Trump has been at the minute. Uh, I don't know how much of his performance will have any impact on the people who already support him whatsoever. It seems like the guy's Teflon. Well, I mean, I don't think his party seem very happy with him, do they? Um, I mean, I don't know... I mean, can they do anything to to make him step down? I don't know. But otherwise, there's four more years of Donald Trump. <laughs> God. Let's move on to something far more cheery. Uh, rape gangs. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, have fun. Rape gangs. So, yes, we have, we have our own problems in the UK at the minute, America. It's not statue related, but I hope you'll agree it's, it's, it's you know, as if not more significant. Uh, and we seem to have a high contingent of South Asian, mostly Pakistani men, uh, you could probably say Muslim, who are forming gangs together to prey on vulnerable, often underage girls and rape them and abuse them. And we're having a very difficult time naming this problem. Uh, it was covered up for a long time. Police were complicit. They've even, you know, government um, reports into this have actually revealed the fact that the police ignored it and turned a blind eye because they were afraid of being thought of as racist if they exposed it. And now we're having a hard time naming the issue. And anyone who does name it seems to get in hot water. Iram, I know you've got plenty to say on this. Yes. Um, well... It's clear that since Rotherham, Rochdale, Oxford, Derbyshire, we've learned absolutely jack shit from all those incidents. Like a fucking Smith song, doesn't it? Yeah, we um, you know we we've seen this so many times where, as you said, mostly Pakistani men um, grooming underage mostly white girls for sex, you know, passing them around and basically treating them like prostitutes, um, abusing them. Threats of violence for speaking up. Often yeah. these girls are vulnerable in, in many ways as well. Yeah, and um, and after each incident, we, we always get you know the same old responses. Lessons must be learned. We must face up to this. Something needs to be done. And guess what? nothing happens and then recently the Labour MP um, Sarah Champion and she's a shadow uh, minister uh, for women and equalities she wrote an article in The Sun oh, The Sun 
Oh, how dare you? She she um she wrote a piece under under the headline British Pakistani men are raping and exploiting white girls and it's time we faced up to it. Now that's a fact, really, isn't it? That's a fact. It's not an opinion. That's a fact. And she said in that Britain has a problem with British Pakistani men raping and exploiting white girls. There, I said it. Does that make me a racist or am I just prepared to call out this horrifying problem for what it is? Um, And then obviously the Sun newspaper had um, an article, a column from one of its writers um, who, who, who said that um, MPs had to tackle what he deemed, quote unquote, the Muslim problem. And that received um, a lot of complaints. You know, there are over 100 cross-party MPs signed an open letter condemning the column for using, quote unquote, Nazi-like language, Nazis again, mm-hmm. um, regarding the Muslim community in Britain. Um, so nearly a week later then sarah champion decides she's going to distance herself from this article saying oh it's been edited by the tabloid it's been stripped of nuance um and then the sun email actually uh, sorry the sun newspaper actually showed an email from her aides saying that she was happy and thrilled with the piece and that the only objection she actually had was the fact that her picture was unflattering and old oh no yeah stitched up there well as a woman i can actually sympathize with that to be (laughs) fair um so yeah she the only thing she complained about was the fact that her picture was old so notice how now this piece was published last friday so she's had ample time if she thought it was unfair to to complain about it and say look you've you've not done my piece justice usually um and, and, and I hate using this phrase, but speaking as a journalist, usually when they get a big name like that, like an MP or whatever, they usually do tend to show you how the piece is going to go on. They usually give you sort of a free ride on it as well, just let you write it how you want. Because a lot of people complained, lots of people complained, people from her own party, of course. Then she started coming out and saying, oh, no, 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 I didn't actually say it like that. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, and then she resigned today, uh, today being Wednesday the 16th, as the shadow um, minister. So keep in mind here, this isn't somebody who said something atrocious and now we're trying to backtrack. That's not what's happened here. She's openly stated an inconvenient truth and it's been published and people have lost their mind about it. I mean, yeah. have I have I completely misread this story or has she basically said that we have a problem with South Asian, particularly Pakistan, Pakistani heritage men raping young white girls in Britain? Um, no, you you're not allowed to say that, even though it's fact. Because it's like I go down the memory hole. Yeah, you're you're inciting hatred now. Come right. On. So, I mean, there's something to be said to this uh, this idea of Asian grooming gangs. That uh, my, many of our American listeners might not know. We we typically in, in the UK use Asian to denote someone of South Asian origin. So we're talking like Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, uh, places like that. It's very rare we'll use Asian to denote a Chinese person. For instance, I think that's probably more common in America. Yeah. So, uh, like, when all these all these news articles in the the newspaper, like Asian grooming gang, this because that's the safe word. They can say Asian. They can they can throw an entire continent so under the bus. Why is it? Why is it? It's okay to say Asian, but it's not okay to say Pakistani. Yeah, and I mean that narrows it why? down even more. Asian makes it broader. If anything, you're implicating <laughs> more people. And these all these poor Chinese people sat around going, "What the." F- fuck have i done there are a lot of indian men who are saying yeah. done lot. that's not it's not me so yeah it doesn't does not help it, we, we've been here so many times before every time these this disgusting news comes out about about young girls being abused and raped by mostly pakistani mostly muslim men it's always the same same people who say the same thing come out with the same cliches we must do something we must face up to this or lessons must be learned why is this happening well okay what are you going to do about it now because this is probably you know the 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 sixth or seventh gang now and these are the ones we know of these are the ones we know of we knew we knew how i mean we've find out how hard it was to bring these to the surface. This took a lot of courageous people speaking out and investigating and digging and digging and digging. How many do we not know of? 
And 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 what's what I find particularly disturbing about these crimes and and something that is very particular to these types of crimes and by these men is that some of these men are actually related to one another. So you'll find that they're, you know, cousins or maybe someone's an uncle of someone and and they're sharing these girls. I think there's something very, very sinister and, and twisted about that. And and the fact is that unfortunately Pakistani men are disproportionately represented in these types of grooming gangs. That's a fact. You you can't get away with it. And, and by denying it, it just, you know, it's no wonder we have people like Tommy Robinson, uh, Anne-Marie Waters. People are listening to them more because they're just coming out and saying it. And, you know, I know other people are going to say, oh, but, you know, oh, they're on the far right. We mustn't let them uh, hijack this issue, blah, blah, blah. Well, they're the only ones who are fucking talking about it, unfortunately. What what are you lot talking about? You're just saying, oh, we must, we must... Um, we're outraged at the sun. We're outraged at the fucking sun for writing a column. And people were saying, oh, what was she thinking writing a column in the sun? Oh, I'm sorry. What was she thinking writing a column in one of the most popular newspapers in the country that could potentially influence other people? I'm sorry, but why is it that if something appears in the sun or the mail, it's like, no, we can't read that because it's the sun and the mail and we hate them. But if it's in the Guardian, oh, I'll read it if it's in the Guardian. But how many people read the Guardian newspaper? You know, if, 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 Newspapers like The Guardian actually published hard-hitting stuff that came out with the truth. Then they'd be fine, but they're not. Yeah. There are certain things they will not fucking publish. So we have to go to publications like The Sun or The Mail or, or The Times or, you know, others that are deemed as being right-wing, you know, Murdoch-owned, Zionist-owned newspapers. They're absolutely ridiculous. It's like these people want to just stay in their own echo chambers and just write newspapers in columns that they agree with and papers that they like. How many people are going to read those um, newspapers, how how much influence is it going to have in the Guardian newspaper or the Guardian website as opposed to, say, the Sun or the Mail? Yeah, I mean, this... You've got to think about it like that as well. You know, I, Nazir Afsar wrote a piece in, uh, you know, for Mail Online and someone said, ugh, I'm not clicking on that link. Why yep. couldn't you write it for something else? He said, oh, well, I did write it in, I think, was it the Guardian? And they said, oh, I'll click on that link. Oh, bravo, bravo. Aren't you Aren't you a great person for not clicking on Mail Online? Oh, don't you deserve a sticker for that? It's ridiculous. People are more interested in where your piece was published rather than the content of the actual article itself. It's lazy. Don't, it is. It's lazy and it's virtue signaling as well. Very much oh, so. Oh, it appeared in the sun. Oh, well, I'm not going to read it. Blah, blah, blah. I think the term virtue signaling was actually coined to denote people who take a, a robust stance against the Daily Mail. You know, well done, you don't like the Daily Mail. But I mean, there's a point to be made here about how lazy this is and how self-defeating it is. Because in, on the self-defeating point, the, the Mail Online is one of the most read websites I don't know if it's in the UK, but I mean, it might even have a bigger reach and that. It's huge. You get something on there, a lot of people are reading it and that's what you want. Secondly, by judging, and this is the genetic fallacy, well, it's come from this place, therefore I don't have to engage with it. I can dismiss it because it's the Daily Mail and the Sun. It's making your critical thinking skills weaker. You need to go in there and read it and you need to tune your brain into what's been said and figure out whether or not it's responsible truthful fact-checking journalism or whether they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes and then you can yes. react responsibly yeah. uh, you, you can then decide well this bit's right but this is bullshit take the right bit and incorporate that into your mental faculties make yourself stronger in the way you address these topics instead of just going to the guardian and getting easy answers uh and get being told what you want to hear um so that, that's how i feel about it i mean i won't I, I I read The Spectator, I read The New Statesman, I, I read The Guardian, I go to the Mail Online, I, I try and get all my bits, I go to far right people on Twitter to see what they're saying, I go to far lefties, I follow, Owen, Owen Jones follows me on Twitter, I follow Owen Jones, 
you know, I, I, I'm critical of things he says. I follow Tommy Robinson on Twitter. Tommy Robinson follows me. I'm critical of things he says, but I want to hear what they've got to say because they have influence within their own realm of, uh, you know, political factions. That Owen on the left, Tommy, I think suppose you'd have to say he's on the right at this point. So I just don't, it's self-defeating to say, I'm not going to read this because it's on the Daily Mail. Read it and make your mind up. Yes, exactly. But it's it's, it's like I'm seeing this everywhere in, on, on Twitter. It's like there's um, there's this sort of purity culture going on now. Oh, this person once shared a platform with this person and this person once wrote for this website that was disgusting. Therefore, they're all beyond the pale. Freaking ridiculous. Hey, and you interviewed that person I don't like and you did not ask that person what I wanted to ask them and you completely ignored this thing about this person that you may or may not have known about and or were interested in and that reveals that you somehow endorsed this view by that person. It, it is ridiculous. No one, if we apply these rules... Because this, 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 bear in mind, this kind of mentality I'm seeing on Twitter now is coming from people who are very vocally anti-Islamism as well. Their own views are deeply unpopular, uh, are not mainstream, and there will be somebody who will point at them and say they're a hate monger, they're a bigot. So does that mean they don't get to talk to anyone now? It, it makes no sense whatsoever. The, the people who speak openly, I mean, Douglas Murray gets it, the, the people who speak openly about this the most have such a small media option anyway given the subject matter so it's not mm. it's no point it's not it's it makes no surprise to me that they're going to speak to people who are on the right listen to what's been said and make a decision from there exactly i mean you know if if the so-called liberal or left media were listening as much or gave them a fair chance then you know they would go to them as well but it's like the, your options as you said are limited so you just go where your message can be heard i have said I, we all say things that are not perfect none of us have halos and but this... that's just it that's just it some people hold people so, to such ridiculously high standards they put them on a pedestal and they it's like they're waiting for them to say one wrong thing like ah that's it you said that one thing off you go i think that might bring us smoothly onto the Aslan Awards. There's this misconception that people derive their values from their scriptures. Who goes to hell? Gays, fags, hundreds and hundreds of Jews. You identify yourself as gay. Why do you then choose to be a Muslim when it says explicitly in Judeo-Christian tradition that that is prohibited? There's this misconception that people derive their values from their scripture. The Aslan <laughs> The Aslan Award is an award given to an apologist spouting lies and nonsense. I have two contenders, Iram, and the first one tacks on to the discussion we've just been having, and that's one man, round-headed Ramadan Foundation, Mo Shafiq, our, our little flappy mouth manked Muslim <laughs> friend. Who you can't say Muslim. You have to say Asian. <laughs> shit. Well, I, no, actually, I can say Muslim. I just can't put it in the sun. Or is it the other way around? I can't remember. What are the rules anymore? Um, so he turns up whenever there's a terrorist attack. He's, he's on hand. He's also available for gang rapes as well. So if, if <laughs> That you, sounded really yeah, wrong. <laughs> Mo Shafiq, open for gang rapes. Bar, mitz <laughs> bar mitzvahs. Going to uh, get sued. Suicide bombings. No, and this is a little bit bittersweet, really, because you have to be fair. I don't like the man. You don't like the man. But he was vocally against these gangs. When Didn't it... he write a column, um, I think it was last year, where he mentioned that one of his own relatives was yeah, so convicted of it? It was a cousin. Yeah. he Actually, yeah, he, he wrote about his own cousin. That, that, does, that does take guts because yes. usually you're not supposed to grass on your own. Snitches get stitches. Um, yeah, I mean, I wanna, there's a point I want to make there because I accept that he did a courageous thing there and I'm grateful for him from within a Muslim community as a man of uh, South Asian origin himself, putting himself out there publicly and, and speaking up about it. And he was, he, he was quite unequivocal about it. He, he admitted there was a problem. There is a problem with Pakistani men uh, grooming young, vulnerable, underage girls for rape, essentially. So he was very strong on that point. Um, and the, the other point I wanted to make is, though, in the article that he wrote, the, people were saying how brave he was for speaking out on this. And I agree he was, but I want really to try and consider what sort of state we're in if you come from a community where you're considered brave if you stand up 
against mass child rape. Isn't that a concern? I mean... We just, we just discussed Sarah Champion having to resign for just speaking facts. It just tells you where we bloody are in yeah. this debate. So Fucking ridiculous. The reason I'm uh, picking on Flappy Mouth Mank, Round-Headed, Moshe Feek for our opprobrium on, on this week's Aslan Award is because... Obviously, like I say, he's available for suicide bombings, gang rapes. Uh, he'll be there on several channels. He's got nothing else on, obviously. But he was interviewed in a newspaper, and I quote, Amongst these criminals, there is a mindset that they think that white girls are worthless. They don't have any regard for their standing within society, and therefore they think they can be used and abused in that way. Quote. So that's... That's a he's named the problem. He's very strong. He's doing it in a way that a lot of people aren't, and he's doing it from in the communities that are having the finger pointed at him. Ten out of ten to Mo Shafiq for that. Um, oh. But he then goes on to say, and this is this is where he edges closer to this week's Aslan Award. But the vast majority of child sex abuse carried out in this country is carried out by white men through the home, through family networks, and through the internet. Now, Iram, question for you. Why would you think in a majoritively white nation most rapes would be committed by... Hang a second, let me check my notes. <laughs> white people. Oh, can I phone a friend? I'm going to have to take your first answer, I'm afraid. I give up. Yeah, so thanks, Mo, for pointing out that in a society filled by mostly one thing, most things will happen by that mostly one thing. That's that's great, Mo. That that really moves the conversation forward. I mean, I don't understand why he chose that moment in time to stick in a what about white people moment there because it's a different phenomenon. And like you've mentioned, you, you unfortunately, you you any any nation, unfortunately, you expect a statistical amount of rape. That's a terrible thing. I think our country's got better at trying to bring them numbers down and trying to prosecute people who are guilty for it, and including uh, sexual assault uh, and various other transgressions and, and abuses under that banner as well. Whereas maybe a time back in the day, they wouldn't have been considered those things, which is good. Mm. This is progress to me. Unfortunately. The amount, the percentage of South Asian Pakistani man, men we have in this country does not map on to their percentage of child grooming offences, unfortunately. Like you say, they're vastly overrepresented. That's the issue. For such a minority, they're overrepresented in this one particular crime. And that should flag out on anyone's, you know, you have a spreadsheet of data, that's going to stick out a little bit. You have a fucking pie chart, that's going to stick out a little bit. You know what I mean? You have an abacus, right? And you're telling, that's going to stick out a little bit. And that's why there's such an emphasis on it, because it's not expected. It's not it's not where you would think should fall within the, the lines of uh, statistical crime in a society. White people are responsible for every bad thing in the world. I mean, come on, it's been 70 years since partition of the Indian subcontinent, you know, and white people were to blame for that, obviously. So, you know, white people to blame for this as well. Yes, the majority of rapists or criminals are going to be white in England, where the majority are white that's not exactly a surprise also um mo Shafi wrote about this subject a couple of years ago i think it was either after rotherham or rochdale and he said the same thing he said oh there you know there are some pakistani men who do see white girls as easy prey etc etc and you think okay well done for for saying that because it's true and then there was this like big massive butt he's like oh why are these girls out on the street they're wearing push-up no. bras they're wearing short skirts why are they wearing that as oh, though fuck that guy it's worse than i thought i'd forgot about that oh yeah oh well i'm glad i reminded you now now you know how bad he is it's like on the one hand he'll come out with something that you know, you think, well done for saying it. And then he goes and spoils it all by saying something stupid like yeah. Some white so slags, basically. <laughs> oh, God, I shouldn't laugh. But he does. He, he went and, and, and ruined it. But you know what? I, what really pisses me off about this whole thing is that people have been people have been using this just to promote their own voices or their own sort of careers. It's all like me, me, me with them. Like, oh, look. I'm going to use this disgusting 
this disgusting case here just to talk about you know what I'm doing and what I've been doing about this when actually you've done jack fucking shit mate you've done jack <laughs> shit what, what exactly does the Ramadan Foundation do? We 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 mention this every time, and I, I'm Can still somebody. I mean, answers in a tweet, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So that that's Mo Shafiq lampoon on this podcast again. I'd rather not speak about him, but he keeps he keeps putting himself forward to the point well, where you. Can't... I'm sorry, but you know he he talks about all this, and yet this this summer he's been touring around with Pakistani extremist sheikhs again. Oh, Mo Mo's Mo problems. Yeah. Okay, I I don't know if we've got time, but I did want to mention another person for the Aslans who... Do it, do it. I haven't mentioned this guy in some time, actually. I thought, you know, maybe I could... Maybe he really wanted to be nominated. Yeah, exactly. He's been really... He's been putting in the hours. And that's how <laughs> our good friend CJ Whirlerman. Um, do, you want, do you want to know what the C stands for? <laughs> I'd rather not say... <laughs> There's a story there, actually. Uh, okay. I, I wrote an article on him. And oh, is it is it going to be one of those like dweeby names like Chester? It is a dweeby name, but I, I'm not going to say it. And there's a reason because I'm better than this. And, uh, and there's a reason. No, you're not. Come on. I, it's it's publicly it's it's publicly available. Um, I'm going to look it up right now. I think I, I, actually, I'm not better than this. When I released a blog after he threatened to sue me for uh, exposing him for plagiarism, and I said, "Do what you need to do," and then he just didn't. Um, I wrote a few more blogs about him exposing various things. I, I uncovered a, like a trove of really anti-Muslim racist tweets that he'd sent out before he saw the light, and he's now like, I think he's, he's probably pro-caliphate at this point. Um, <laughs> So I released them, and what I did is I I went to find out what the CJ stood for in his oh name. Oh my god, he's called Courtney. <laughs> so how have you found that? <laughs> Tell me how you found that before I proceed with the story. I just I just typed in CJ Willerman bio, and it came on Alcatron dot com. There you go. Okay, so here's my point. Here's my point. I wrote an article about him, uh, and I wrote his full name in Courtney. Jay Willman, because I wanted people, if they Google this man's name, if they type CJ Willman, it might not bring it up, but if they know him as Courtney Willman, it might. So I made sure they were both in there so the search engine could find it, right? Now I got his name uh, publicly, like you did, and it's not just on like biographies and things. He's actually put content out under his full name before, and at some point he stopped doing it. It's still there. <laughs> Um, I don't blame him. It's still there. Yeah, no, that is my point. I just assumed because it's some kind of effeminate name and he's the kind of, he's got this like, Ameri he's got this Australian really lads-like swagger attitude, used car salesman vibe about him. I just assumed that he thought that he wouldn't be taken seriously with Courtney as his, his first name. And, you know, it's worked for him because everyone takes him seriously without it. So, but anyway, that's not the interesting bit. So I, I put this in the article, put his name in, and I got an email from him. And he he, uh, he essentially said, you know, he's not, you know, he he takes responsibility for the the content of the the blog, but could I could I just please remove remove his his name? And he, <laughs> what dweeb? But he, he he cited security reasons. He said because he worries about people finding out where he lives. Now I, I respect that. And I removed it straight away. It was no problem. I, I don't want to, in my writing and my work, I don't want to make someone feel fearful for their security mm. or safety, if that's it. I'm well within my right to use that because it's public information. It's, it's everywhere already. He's not hiding it very well. I just found it a little bit hypocritical coming from a man who spends his time increasing the security concerns of every Muslim reformist he smears or every critic of Islam he smears, the, the lies he puts out about Majid Nawaz and, and Sam Harris, yet he wants to tell me to remove some truth because he's got security concerns. So fuck Courtney Willman. He's called Courtney. He's got, <laughs> he's got a girl's name. There, I said it. Everyone knows. <laughs> This is public information. Uh, this is not a dox. <laughs> oh, I feel better. I feel like there's a weight off my shoulder. <laughs> did that feel good? It did. Fantastic. I really, I really did want his name to be something like Chester. Okay, why is he actually? Is this is this the reason why he's nominated for an Aslan or for an actual reason? <laughs> yeah. And he's he's got a girl. He's got a girl's name. <laughs> He's got a girl's name, and that's why he's this week's Aslan Award winner. <laughs> no, oh, he, 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 
He, uh, Courtney J. Willman. Courtney, <laughs> Courtney Jezebel Willman <laughs> has been nominated for this week's Aslan Award because this prick made the equivalence between ex-Muslims and Nazis. He linked to a piece in that well-balanced uh, periodical Middle East Eye, which was basically covering the Muslim Council of uh, the ex-Muslim Council of Britain's march at the Pride um, marches in in London. They carried placards around with things like "Allah is gay," you know, Islamophobia is an oxymoron, and, and things quite you know provocative signs. But fine, mm. you know, it's the Pride march. It's it's you know we're here, we're queer, we're in your face. That's the message. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> couple of Muslims in in uh, Britain weren't so happy about this, was they? They said that Allah is gay sign was Islamophobic. Um, I don't know that. How does that some... work? I don't know, because really, doesn't... I don't... I don't know. I mean, what about other signs? You know, haven't haven't these parades had people sh- have with, with, like, Jesus is gay yes. signs and stuff like that? So why does this deserve an exception it it it, rem, it reminds me of that wonderful moment in alan partridge the movie where alan partridge's dj says on air that they should probably mix islam and judaism and call it jislam and uh alan partridge has a massive panic and off air he basically chastises his co-host and says you never ever ever make fun of islam only christianity and jews a little bit and i think i think that's perfect isn't it that's how everyone sees things yeah um and 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 shamefully pride organizers are bowing down to this yep they're scared i I don't know if they've made a decision but they are and and this article was sort of written in the is slanted towards the East London Mosque, you know, which has invited speakers who are blatantly homophobic, and yet Pride is taking them seriously. Um, and then, obviously, CJ Worleman said... Courtney, Ex-Muslim. you've got to name the problem here, Ram. Name the problem. <laughs> Fine. So Courtney Jezebel came out and said... <laughs> <"Ex-Muslim."> <laughs> oh, my God. I'm never going to be able to look at him in the same way ever again. So, um, he who must not be named, um, he said, oh, ex-Muslims are basically, use the same language as Nazis. And you think, how did you go from that to Nazis? I don't get it. Well, I'll read you what he said, um, just so we've got the full cunt text he said um he he tweeted out this article in middle east high and he said ex-muslims not only adopt the same tactics as nazis they're also supported by nazis and white supremacists now it's funny this because this was the trope that he took with in quote unquote new atheist when they pulled his pants down and spanked him for being a liar and a plagiarist and disowned him and he became a joke all of a sudden overnight atheists became white you know a white supremacist movement you know uh, racist in with the neo nazis because neo nazis white supremacists are not nice so if you can peg that on somebody and have people believe it that's a win because you've destroyed people essentially so and unfortunately for him this whole if you go after islam thing you're racist becomes a very difficult position to hold when you have ex-Muslims saying, actually, I'm non-white, uh, I'm from a Muslim background, and I don't quite care for Islam either anymore, I'm an ex-Muslim. So he has to find new ways to denigrate them. So he's just reached for the white supremacist Nazi label again. It's just this one thing where these people are not on my page, these people are showing up my ideological shortcomings, How, what can I do? Can I debate them with better arguments? No, call them a Nazi and call them a white supremacist and that'll do the job. That's what they do. They don't want to hear the other side. They'll just block or mute or call them a Nazi and that's it, you're done. Yep. So who deserves the Aslan, Mo or Courtney? I think we're going to have to give it to our Courtney. Courtney. Courtney, uh, <laughs> Courtney Cock. Um, <laughs> fuck it out. Oh, it's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think, 
CJ Willman, I think. He, I, that's mine, unless you unless you really want to give it to Mo and then we'll toss a coin. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, we'll, we'll give, we can't not give it to Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations to Courtney Cock, Jezebel Willman, for being this week's recipient of the Aslan Awards. <laughs> I think I think we've pretty much nailed it for one week. Unless there's anything else you want to get in. Um. Oh. Um. <laughs> I think this this is quite. This has clearly been our best work. <laughs> oh my god, we're like school kids. Um. Was there anything else to Courtney? Mention? <laughs> 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 oh, that's just, that's oh so fuck! I'm gonna have to open a window. <laughs> Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh. No. Okay, well. <clears throat> professional voice. <laughs> Shitty now. I can't, I can't stop laughing. Um, it's been a pleasure as usual. Are you sure there's, uh, there's nothing else you want to get in at all? I don't know that with loads of stuff, but... I... <laughs> <laughs> we, t- we took it all up with pure aisle jokes about, about oh. what the world <laughs> That's going to be the most immature taken. We really have taken the myth. We have. This, is gonna, this one's going to be about 40 minutes when I'm done editing it. I, I mean, I did have written down uh, a complete breakdown of the socioeconomic disparity within the Middle East and how we can achieve a greater cohesion uh, in terms of reducing terrorism and increasing welfare, but I just didn't have time to fit it in. No, next week. Next time. Perfect. All right, Iram. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure as usual. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening to this Taking the Myth edition of the Godless Spell Checker podcast. I'm Stephen Knight. You can support the podcast by visiting patreon.com forward slash G Spell Checker. You can support my wonderful host, Iram Ramzan, by visiting sedar.org. I think we've all learned something here today.